Thank you very much for the nation, man. See you. Huh? You read Luke 11, verse 1. They said, get this. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. They recognized his prayer with his heavenly father was the secret to his power. His ability to connect with his father was the secret to his wisdom. His ability to connect with his heavenly father was the secret to his effectiveness. And man, when they connected the dots, they said, that's it. We wanted to learn the value of that solitary place that can come a sacred space where we can connect with you in a daily way. And so they say, teach us to pray. Morning, everyone. Glad you are here. Thank you for watching online. Thank you for sharing the services as you do. If it's possible for you to get on campus, we'd love for you to be back. It's great to see some of you uh, who haven't been able to be here in a while. Good to see you back and pray the services are always a blessing to you. As you know, we're in a, a series in our church of 21 days of prayer and fasting. And as you also know, we have over a thousand of our people who have committed to the process of pressing into God a little more than normal of seeking God, probably a little more than they, um, they used to, so that God may then be able to open up some opportunities, some doors, some provision for them maybe they've never seen before. Uh, someone as well said, if you want something from God you've never had before, you have to be willing to go somewhere with God you've never been before. So pressing into him at a new level will open up your mind and heart to be able to receive some things God has especially for you. And in this time of, of prayer and in this time of fasting, I do pray that the Spirit of God will reveal some things to you that you've never seen, that he'll answer some prayers in a way that you can definitely connect to this emphasis on prayer. And I'm praying that for our overall church family. I really want to see God do something wonderful and significant, not that he hasn't been already, but to see him do something very unique as we press into a brand new year. Now, the first weekend, when I talked to you about prayer and fasting, we talked about the potential of prayer. Prayer has enormous potential. You never have to say any, to someone, there's nothing I can do. There's always something you can do. You can pray. You can pray. So prayer has great potential because prayer moves the heart of God. And then we said last weekend, prayer has great power. Prayer has great power. There's nothing too hard for God. We've told you before, there's no sin that he cannot forgive. There's no burden that he cannot lift. There's no problem that he cannot solve. So what are you facing today? What is it that is uh, burdening your heart, that is clouding your mind? Can I challenge you to pray about that? And in praying about that, you not only realize the great potential that lies with prayer, but the great power that lies in prayer. Now this morning, I wanna challenge you to this. I wanna challenge you to the practice, the practice of prayer. I hope when this 21 days is concluded that you will continue on in your disciplines of prayer, of pressing into God. I, we, we just tried to get you kind of jump started off into a new year to help you develop maybe some new habits where you might connect prayer with something you do every day. When you're driving into work, maybe you're taking your shower, uh, maybe you exercise in the mornings. Connect prayer with something you do every day. Make it a part of your daily discipline. In the first century, when you study that era in church history, you'll find that the people had moved away from prayer. Uh, prayer was not part of their daily disciplines. A lot of it was due to the teaching of the rabbi. The rabbi had taught that prayers were something that were difficult, that you had to pray an appropriate prayer at the appropriate time with the appropriate verbiage. Uh, there was one prayer that had 63 adjectives in the name of God. And you not only had to get all of those adjectives correct, you had to get them in the right order. <laughs> and so it's like you gotta pray the right prayer for the right occasion. When you, you, you think you're gonna have a baby, there's a certain prayer you pray. Uh, when you have a new business opportunity, there's a certain prayer you have to pray. And you could see, folks, how people got frustrated because they thought, I'm not doing it right. I, I can't follow all the rules, it's too hard. So people just moved away from prayer. And when Jesus' ministry began, one of the first things that he did, as we'll see this morning, 
is he talked about how practical prayer can be. Prayer is a conversation. I told you last week we don't pray prayers. Uh, I'm sorry, we don't say prayers, we pray prayers. Prayer is conversation. Just like you and I would have a conversation, you have a conversation with God. You tell him what's on your mind. Uh, I think those conversations ought to be honest. As we'll see this morning in Matthew 6, Jesus said, don't be hypocritical when you pray. So those prayers should be very honest. Uh, If you're confused, just pray a confused prayer. (laughs) If you're mad, pray a mad prayer. Um, If you don't understand, just pray a a prayer and you just say, God, I don't understand. I talked to somebody last week and their dilemma was just simply, I broke it down. It's just why me, why this, why now? (laughs) And boy, couldn't that be the outline of a lot of our experiences in life? Why me, why this, why now? (laughs) And so I I told them, I said, well, you just need to be honest with God. You You just need to pray. Just tell him how you're feeling. Here's what I know about God. He can take it. He can handle it. Now, some people, you don't want to, you you hate to go that last 2%. You know the last 2%, right? Where you tell somebody what you need to tell them, and you don't tell them the last 2%. And you get in the car, and you drive away, and you go, man, that was the most important part of the conversation, and I pulled up. I didn't have the heart to do it. I didn't have the courage to do it. I didn't tell them the last 2%. And most of the time, the truth of what you need to say is not in the 98, it's in the last 2%. So you go back to that rule of find the right time, find the right tone, find the right turf, and tell them the last 2%. But when you do that, don't attack the person, attack the problem. You don't remember the rules of engagement there. And the point I'm making is sometimes we go to God that way. We tell him everything except the big thing that's on our minds and hearts. And I always go back to this. He's sovereign. He knows anyway. So why are we pulling back and not being honest with him? All we're doing is hurting ourselves by not getting that out of us. Uh, A prayer is like strength training. You have the, think about strength training. You You have the weights that press down on you and then you push the weights up and it's resistance training. And so you in the resistance training, you're building muscle. You're breaking it down and you're building it up. That's what prayer is. Prayer is when the problems of life press down on you, you push them back up toward heaven. And as you do that, you're going to develop some spiritual muscle. And it isn't long until that becomes memory muscle where you will automatically, your go-to will be to, to pray. You'll say, Lord, help me with this. Give me wisdom. Help me to know how to respond to this text. Help me know how to respond to this uh, direct message. Help me know how to respond to this email. Help me know how to respond. I, 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 I want to say the right thing with the right spirit. So you you began to engage and you began to bring God into every aspect of your life. That's what prayer does. And so prayer is a very very practical thing, as I'm saying. Prayer is a very practical thing. And so, in fact, when I look in the Bible, the Bible warns us about some things that can hinder prayer. Let Let me give you three or four here that I identified. Here's one of the things that will hinder prayer. Selfishness. Selfishness will hinder your prayer. Listen to James 4, 3. When you ask, when you pray and you don't get what you're praying for. It's because you ask with the wrong motive. You ask that you might spend what you get on your own pleasure. Now, what was James saying? James is saying, check your motive. Make sure my motive when I pray is the right motive. Sometimes I can be very selfish, self-centered, and he's saying here in James, that will hinder your prayers being answered. Here's the second thing that can hinder prayer, not just selfishness, but sinfulness. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, your sins have made a separation between you and your God. Get the, get the wording of that. God is separated because of sin. Because anyone, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, there we go. Uh, your sins have separated you from your God and have hidden his face from you. And listen to this phrase, so he will not um, hear you. It didn't say he cannot. He said he will not. You, you always think about, look at the hand, talk to the hand, right? What he's saying here is not that God is separated from you in terms of relationship. Let me go back and talk a moment about eternal security. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says in Ephesians 1, you in that moment are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So when Isaiah says your sins separate you from God, what he's saying is it doesn't affect your relationship. He's your father. You're his child. It affects your fellowship, your fellowship. Those are two things that tie you to God, relationship, fellowship. You can be in a relationship with someone right at this moment and be out of fellowship with them. (laughs) You could have had a debate with the mate all the way on the drive into church, and now you walk in and, hey, everybody, how you doing? 
And you're thinking right now, we're finishing this when we get in the car. I hadn't forgotten anything. So I understand how that works. Now, what does that mean? You're still in a relationship with that person. You still love them. Maybe more at other times than maybe now. But you're in a relationship, but the fellowship's not so hot. That's what Isaiah is saying. Isaiah is saying when we drift away from God and we allow sin to come into our life, unconfessed sin, then it doesn't affect relationship. It affects fellowship. And he says to the point that he won't hear us. He's saying, you got to fix this. You can't ignore this. This is something that is keeping me and you from being able to get along. You have to work on the relationship. Just as you have to work on your relationship in your life, you work on your spiritual relationship with your heavenly father. And so he's warning us that selfishness and sinfulness can hinder prayer. Here's the third one. There's also faithlessness, faithlessness. Uh, Matthew 13, 58, the Bible says, he did not do many mighty works among them. Now here's the reason, because of their unbelief. They didn't believe he would, so he didn't. They didn't believe he could, so he didn't. <laughs> Faithlessness affects the prayer. We have to pray in faith, believing. Believing God is able, believing he can, believing he will. And so these are the things that can hinder prayer. Selfishness and sinfulness and faithlessness. Here's a fourth one. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. Mark eleven twenty five. 25. When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you. When you are unforgiving, you're burning the bridge over which you must travel. God is saying, let that go. Let them go, and I can let you go. I can forgive you. And it's hard sometimes to harbor hatred in your heart when you're trying to press into God because there's just no way those two emotions can stand in the same body. You can't have hatred toward your neighbor while having love toward God. It's something you have to work on. And sometimes the, the, the anger that we have toward other people isn't reconcilable. I'll give you that caveat. It's not reconcilable. You can't fix every problem you have with other people. So what do you do with that? Do you stay angry and, and demanding until they finally make things right with you? You may stay angry and, and demanding for the rest of your life. You, you know, there are some people that just don't, they're narcissistic, they're selfish, they don't recognize the pain that they've caused you, and they don't see the damage, and they don't agree with you. When you tell them you've hurt me, they don't agree with it. So what, what do you do with that? Do you hold it? Do you refuse to release it? When you hold on to that, thinking that that in some way is going to bring them to a point where they will make things right, all you begin to do is damage yourself. And I'm just saying what you have to do with some people and what you have to do with some things is you have to turn them and it over to God. You say, Lord, <laughs> I cannot fix this. I can't fix them. I don't think it's my job actually to do that. That's why there is a Holy Spirit. <laughs> and instead, all I can do is take care of me all I can do is keep that out of my heart. So what I'm going to do is release it and release them. And let me tell you something. Sometimes you got to do that every day. <laughs> sometimes you have to do that many times every day. <laughs> remember what Jesus, remember that the, seven times 70? If somebody, you know, how many times you forgive them? You know, they were like, all right, well, what's the least amount I can do this and get by, right? He goes, seven times 70, meaning just an infinite number. You, you, why? because it's good for your mental health, it's good for your spiritual health, it's good for your emotional health, if you can get to a point, guys, where you can let some stuff go. That's all forgiveness means is release. And God is saying one of the things that hinder prayer is when you're unwilling to release things and you're unwilling to release people. It's interesting, I read a study from the University of Michigan. It was just done by some sociologists and professors there and it was interesting, they did this study where they tested the impact that praying had on a person. Uh, what, what was the impact of praying for other people? And they looked at it compared to the people who prayed for other people as opposed to people who did not pray for other people. And they did this test sample, and it was interesting. Let me just give you two or three things that they found. They found, number one, praying for a stranger led them to report less anger toward other people than those who didn't pray. I mean, just praying for a stranger meant you would have less anger toward people who didn't pray. Here's the second finding. Praying for someone who has angered them made them less aggressive toward that person than those who didn't pray. That was interesting. 
less aggressive. You've been hurt by someone, you start praying. Remember the Bible said, pray for your enemies, pray for those who despitefully use you. Well, that's good theology, but it's good psychology. Because in that, it will have a, a way of releasing some aggression that you may have and some anger. Here's the third finding. Praying for a friend in need made those who prayed less judgmental and more willing to help than those who didn't pray. Now, those are the si uh, findings from the University of Michigan, not a Christian study at all, just simply looking at what are the effects of prayer on people. So I'm saying when you get into the practice of prayer, prayer will do more for you than it will do for the person you're praying for. <laughs> it is incredible the impact that praying can have. No wonder when the apostles saw Jesus pray and they saw his daily disciplines, no wonder they said in Luke 11, Lord, <laughs> teach us to pray. Teach us to do that. That's the thing we need to know. How do we do the practical side of prayer? And in answer to that, here's what Jesus told them. You have a Bible? Look at Matthew 6 real quick. Matthew 6, this is called, many of you call it the Lord's Prayer. Some of you probably have this recited. You, or you could have it committed to memory. You could recite it, I should say. You already have that done. I had a pastor friend. He was at a, a service, and he uh, was going to recite the Lord's Prayer. And he got like two lines in and forgot how it went. I mean, he's recite, you know what I mean? Like that scene from uh, Christmas Vacation where she starts, you know, I pledge allegiance to the flag in the middle of her, you know, it was that kind of a thing. Where he's, I mean, you know, our father who art in heaven, then he goes into, I pledge, I don't know what he did. He just said, you know, you, you know the thing. You know, that's been done before. You know, you know the thing. Uh, so in Matthew 6, I thought it would be great as we look at this Lord's Prayer. And really, guys, it's, it's, it's really more aptly refer, should be referred to as the model prayer. This is the prayer Jesus uses to teach his disciples to teach us to pray. So look at it, Matthew 6, look at verse 9. If not, take a look at the screen, and we have this for you. And he said, after this manner you pray. And let's pray this together out loud, shall we? Number one, here we go. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. If I break that prayer apart a little bit for you this morning, I want to point out four elements that teach you the practical aspects of prayer. Number one, it involves reverence. Reverence. He opens it by saying, our Father. And I love this because as far as I know, this is the first time in Scripture God is ever referred to as a father. And Jesus calls him Father. And he says, our Father. And what's beautiful about that is he's, he's not instructing you to go pray through someone to get to God. You don't have to pray through me. Now, I can pray for you. That's intercession. But you don't have to come to me to get me to go to God on your behalf. You have direct access. He said, our father. He's your father. He's the one who loves you. He's the one who cares for you. He knows you better than you. And Jesus said, the first thing he said is recognize the fact that when you come in prayer to God, you come as a child asking of his or her father. So it involves reverence. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy, respectful, honored be your name. You know, the Bible gives two responsibilities of children to their parents. Ephesians 6. Number one, it says, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's the first command with a promise, that it may go well with you, and you may live long on the earth. God is saying there is a principle that I honor when a child obeys their parent. And a lot of juvenile delinquency problems we have in our country, I think, started as parental delinquency. Parents just not engaged with their kids, and parents not instructing and giving direction to their kids. So we parents, we have an awesome, heavy responsibility. Now, that's not to say those little boogers aren't going to twist off and do some crazy stuff. You know, you go back to the Garden of Eden. I mean, look how that, I mean, you have Adam and Eve, and then you have Cain and Abel. And I mean, the first murder in the Bible is a brother kills his brother. We call that a dysfunctional family. <laughs> That was, that was the original family. So don't beat yourself up too much about if you've got you know, kids that are kind of twisting off on you in this season of life. Proverbs 22.6 says, train up the child in the way they should go. And then it says, 
when they are old, they'll not depart from it. Didn't say they wouldn't twist off when they're young. <laughs> so sometimes you can do the right thing, raise them the right way, and those little boogers just twist off. So you just keep praying for them and know this, you put good stuff in them, and sooner or later, they're gonna come back around. It's amazing how the older they get, the smarter you become. And the Bible says, look, you are as a child, if you're in the home with your parents, you obey them, you obey them. You obey them as unto the Lord, for this is right. A child cannot be right with God and wrong with their parents. A child has to obey mom and dad. They're the first authority figure in the home. If a child doesn't respect their parent, they won't respect their teacher, they will not respect their coach, they will not respect their, um, uh, the police officer, they will not respect anyone in authority if they don't respect their parent. So the first step is train up a child. And you don't wanna wait 100 pounds in 16 years too late to start that, by the way. So you wanna start early, and you wanna teach them the value and the consequence of, of obedience. I know there's a thing in schools now, it's been around for a while, some of you teachers know all about this, love and logic, right? My mom didn't get in on love and logic. I was raised before Dr. Spock wrote that book, meaning that my mom would oftentimes, and so would my dad, uh, apply the board of education to the seat of knowledge. <laughs> Did you have that experience? Now, they didn't abuse us, uh, but being the middle child, I, I felt like I had to bear the brunt of a lot of that. How many middle children in here? You'll feel, you know, God bless you, middle children. Yeah. I mean, the first one, they come along and they just can do no harm. Oh, we're the first baby that's ever been born. You know, they're the first one. The second one, what do they do? They overcompensate. Oh, we're going to correct the course with this one. And then the third one, they just mail it in. My little brother, yeah. <laughs> so those middle children, right? But my mom didn't, my dad, they didn't read Dr. Spock. So they, 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 we had a healthy fear of that. We knew there were, con if I got in trouble at school, I'm in trouble at home. There was never taking the word of a kid over a teacher, not in my generation. I mean, if that teacher said something, I would say, but this, yeah, you, 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 nope. That teacher said this, this is, and boy, there was some direct, so I wouldn't tell him if I got in trouble. No, are you kidding me? I mean, I may be a lot of things, but stupid wasn't one of them. Because my parents said, you're in trouble there, you're in trouble here. And I can, rem I can remember, boy, I, I, I'll get back on this in a minute. Y'all bear with me. I can, can you remember walking down school, guys, and seeing one of the coaches in the hall with a paddle in his hand? Good Lord. Did that put the fear of God in you? Oh, my gosh. I still have two, I don't know how I ended up with them. Honest to God, I don't. I've got two paddles at the house that somehow ended up at my house from school when I was a kid. And one of them, man, I had a coach at Everman and he drilled holes in the paddle. I guess so it'd whistle when he popped you. <whistles> Bang, I don't know. But the point is it kind of put a healthy amount of fear in us kids. Now I'm not suggesting that you go home and just wear your kid out. I, what I'm, I don't want him hating me. Uh, come on, Bill said, no, I'm not saying. I, I'm saying there's gotta be, there's gotta be some respect and you be creative and you, you know, figure out what their pressure points are. And you have, you have to know this is going to get an effect because you're going to have a compliant child in your house, don't you? And then you're going to have a strong-willed child in your house, don't you? Don't you love the compliant ones? They're always the firstborn most of the time. Because if you had the strong-willed child, you wouldn't have a secondborn. That'd be, you'd just be out. You'd be done. Like that woman said, hey, if you had to do it all over again, would you still have kids? She said, yeah, just not the same ones. <laughs> so you learn, what was I saying? Obedience, obey. Now that happens when they're in the home, but here's the second part, and this goes to reverence. That's where I was going. This goes to reverence, and that is respect. Honor your father and mother. Honor your father. Now that means out from under their roof, when you're out on your own, you honor them. Maybe you don't, you don't obey them anymore. You may still fear them, <laughs> but you don't obey them because that's not, you're not under that umbrella. You have your own family, you have your own life, you have your own home, you're grown. But what do you owe your parents now? Not obedience, you owe them honor. Now, what does the word mean? Honor means you give greater weight, greater weight to their opinion. You give greater weight to what they think. In other words, when you honor your mom or you honor your dad, you're listening to what they say and you're weighing it heavier than you would someone else. 
because you know they love you and you know they know you. Now, that doesn't mean they're always right. It just means they're always worthy of respect. And what he's saying as a child, just as we have all this we talk about with our kids and with us, he's saying, man, when you go to your heavenly father, you have a fear about him. There's, there's nothing wrong with a fear. Not a cringing dread of God that he's going to mash you like a bug in a rug. It's not a fear of a, in the sense that he's going to kill you. It's a fear in the sense you recognize how powerful he is, how incredible he is, how God can take the things in my life right now and in an instant can turn them and make them begin to work for my good and his glory. And boy, when I pray, I recognize, boy, you're my father, and you are, you're not just powerful, you're all powerful. There's nothing you can't do. So the first thing Jesus said is understand he deserves respect. I reverence. Secondly, it involves dependence, our dependence upon God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here's what prayer looks like. Prayer is not me going to God, asking for my will to be done in heaven. Prayer is me going to God, asking for his will to be done on earth. You see, he wants what's best for us. He wants only <laughs> the best for us. And he says here, your kingdom come. Now, there's a, an application that you might say. There's some prophetic application. It's not the interpretation of that phrase where you pray for his kingdom to come, meaning his return, his rule on the earth. Like you read uh, Revelation 22, 20, something I try to pray every day. It's the next to the last verse in the Bible where they say, even so come Lord Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's part of my, I, that's part of my daily prayer. I mean, just to fix this mess <laughs> and to help us through this, even so come Lord Jesus, right? So when you say your kingdom come, there's a sense in which it, it, there's, an, there's an application that you can make. Remember when you study the Bible, there's interpretation and application. Uh, I'm gonna have to explain that. Interpretation means this is what the literal meaning of the text is. And you get interpretation from context. Uh, the Bible will define itself. For example, when the Bible uses a word like um, sanctification, you go back to the first time the word is used in Scripture, and however that word is used in that context will typically be the way it's defined throughout all the Bible. So sanctification does not mean sinless perfection. I'm just using this as an illustration. Sanctification was used in Genesis where the Bible says the Lord blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Well, he means he set it apart. So if you use the law of first mention for biblical interpretation, then you take the first mention of a word in the Bible, see how it's used, and then it'll be used that way throughout all of, all of Scripture. And so when he talks about your kingdom come, there's, it's, not the, it's not the interpretation, it's the application. Now, you can use an application and not do harm to it so long as you don't use it in a way where it violates other Scriptures. Like... <laughs> You can't find a tooth and build a dinosaur, for example. You can't say the Bible says wrestle not against, you know, flesh and blood. Well, we can't wrestle because the Bible says wrestle not. So can't be on the wrestling team. The Bible says wrestle. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you can get silly. You can twist the Bible and contort it and make it say anything you want to say. So you have to re read it in context and know what those words mean. So there is an interpretation, and there's no scripture of any private interpretation, but there are many applications. In Revelation, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and come and open, I'll fellowship with him and he with me. When I was in uh, Sunday school, we had flannel graph. And I remember a teacher using this picture of an old wooden door with this uh, guy that looked like um, a grateful dead uh, knocking on the door. And that was like Jesus back then. And so he's knocking on the door. And he, she said, All right, boys and girls, uh, that's Jesus. He's knocking on your heart's door. If anyone, you know, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Well, that's, that's an application of that, which is good. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, he does knock at the door. But the interpretation, what that actually means is, he's on the outside of one of his churches trying to get in. <laughs> he said, hello, you're doing this without me, and you can. But if you want anointing and favor and blessing, you need to let me back in my church. That's the interpretation. So when you look at thy kingdom come, yes, there's an application where you can pray for him to return. But the interpretation is kingdom means rule. What you're saying to God is, I want your rule in my life. You're the king who has a kingdom. 
your kingdom come. You're saying, God, I want you to rule in my life. I want you to be in charge. That's why he follows it. Thy kingdom come, the next phrase, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Every time I've ever gotten in trouble, it's always because I've exerted my will above his will. That's, if we can just yield to the will of God in our life, we can walk the line. But every time you get in trouble, it's because you're pushing your will over the will of God. And he's saying here, man, pray this, pray, respect him and desire for his rule to be effective in your life. Thirdly and hurriedly, it involves not only our acceptance, but it also involves, I'm sorry, our dependence, but it also involves our acceptance is the third word, acceptance. Give us this day our daily bread, mark that. Forgive us our debts as we forgive debtors, mark that. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Our acceptance is getting to that point where we're saying, God, I fully trust you. However way you direct me, however way you uh, open this door of opportunities for me today, I accept that as your will. Henry Blackaby did a great series called Experiencing God, and we've done numerous of them in our church. And one of the principles of experiencing God, he says, you try to discern where God is at work in your life today and join him there. Where's he at work? What, is there a friend somehow got on your radar? Is maybe God challenging you to reach out to a friend? Um, is that child just needing a little extra attention today and maybe they're acting out or maybe they're hurt or they're quiet? Maybe, maybe that child needs a little extra attention. You, you see what I mean? You, God is at work and I'm just needing to be discerning of where he's at work. And so he's saying, be sensitive to God here. Realize that he will use you, he will work in and through you. And, and part of the process as we're walking with him each and every day is we say, Lord, help me not to drift into temptation. Lead us not, it, it's not that God God will lead you into temptation in the, in the sense that James 1 says, God cannot tempt you, neither can he be tempted. The word temptation actually can be translated as test. Now, God will test you. He won't tempt you. But here's what I know. On every side of every circumstance are both of those items. On one side, you're going to get tested, and on the other side, you're going to be tempted. The devil and the angel on the shoulder. Remember the cartoon? On one side, there's a temptation to give up, walk away, forget it, I'm done. On the other side is the test. You can do this, you're strong, you can overcome this, don't quit. So you got that pull on you all the time. And the prayer here of acceptance is saying, God, help me to steer clear of things that might be stronger than I am. Help me to steer clear of things that might take me down or take me under. Don't let me face more than you know I can, I can handle. And I love that verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has come upon you except what is common. God will is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear, but with the temptation, he'll provide a way out that you can bear it. Here's the fourth one, and we're done. It involves confidence. Confidence. How did he close that prayer? Your kingdom come. Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yours is the kingdom the kingdom again. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. He recognized the fact that you can pray confidently. You can pray, listen, knowing God will hear you. Now, I'd check those four hindrances. If you don't feel like you're getting through, check those. And if all those are good, sometimes, as I said last week, his delays aren't denials. Sometimes the feeling may not be there, but I can assure you based on his word, he hears you when you pray, listen to 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence, there's our word, that we have in God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So God is listening as long as it's according. He's not gonna give us something that's gonna hurt us. Um, now, he may give us something that might teach us. You remember when the, the um, children of Israel were going through the desert and they were tired of manna? God was giving them, I mean, Krispy Kremes from heaven. I mean, just not really. But he was giving them fresh bread from heaven every morning. Just make sure you're awake. Every morning they're getting fresh bread from heaven. And one day they said, we want meat. We want meat. You know, we, we want, you know they wanted quail. So, man, God just, just, man, just puts quail everywhere. And then there's this text in Hebrew, um, I'm sorry, in Psalms. It says this. It says, he gave them their request, but he sent leanness into their soul. 
He gave them what they wanted, and they missed what they needed. Now, sometimes the worst thing that could happen to us is for us to get what we think we want, right? But sometimes as we persist in prayer, God will say, I don't think you're going to learn any the other way, <laughs> so I'm going to let you have this. That's not going to really hurt you, but it's going to teach you, so you'll come back to square one and trust me going forward. Now, sometimes he does that. I've seen, I show you in scripture where he's allowed people to have things they thought they wanted, and after they had it, they were thinking, what was I thinking, right? They were so sick of quail before that was over, and God was saying, trust me, just trust me. So my suggestion to you this morning is to realize the fact that when you pray, pray with confidence. Pray with a sense of trust that God is going to answer me according to his will. And I've told you before, he only wants for you what you would want for you if you just knew what he knows. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful group of folks who are here this morning. Thank you for the worship. Thank you for the time of fellowship. Thank you that we can see one another, talk with one another, pray for one another. Thank you for those who've watched and are watching online. I, I pray you'll minister to their hearts Thank you, Father, for the privilege of prayer. And as we press into you each day, I, I pray, Father, you will truly open some windows, some doorways into the lives of your people that they can draw direct connection to what you're doing and what they've been praying. Bless them this week. Bless their businesses. Bless their families. Keep your hand of favor on their lives. I pray they'll walk out of this room in peace and they'll have a wonderful day today. And finally, Lord, if there's one who never trusted you as Savior, I pray this might be the moment when they say, Lord Jesus, with everything I know about me, I now trust all I know about you. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. I pray this in Jesus' name.